close and hold me fast This magic spell you've cast It is lovey on rose This Franco-Irish literary cabaret um, was supposed to happen in spring 2020. Um, I work uh, at Buswell's Hotel in the city centre, which is the neighbour of the Alliance Francaise. And we usually do these cabarets in Buswell's. And I approached the Franco-Irish Literary Festival and was part of their festival two years ago. And this was a year ago. Um, I was thinking of France, Ireland connections and nature. So my, my, my mind was drawn to the mountains of Morne, the cliffs of Moor and the ring of Kerry. And I remembered a beautiful short story by Claire Keegan, where a writer with writer's block goes to nature as a retreat and for inspiration. So I also remembered that I volunteered for Noel Campbell Sharp, who ha has a artist's retreat in Kerry, in Skerrig. And I googled Southern Ireland retreat and Charles de Gaulle popped up. <laughs> okay, <laughs> because um, in a, that's a French Irish connection and the first of the evening and to mark it i have a sound cue first franco-irish connection of the evening in 1969 that's when charles de gaulle came to ireland okay in 1969 my mother left northern ireland and went to spain in the middle of the franco era smoking and wearing a mini skirt with her best friend, a, a scandal. My mother uh, met my father, Juan Betancur, okay? Fra Franco-Irish connection. Let me just hit the drums. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, I am, ladies and gentlemen, a descendant of Jean de Betancourt, okay, uh, a French explorer who in 1402 did an expedition to the Canary Islands on behalf of Castile. So to this day, the name Betancourt and variations of it is a very popular surname in the Canary Islands. Now, back to 1969 and Charles de Gaulle and his wife coming to Ireland, okay? Between 1968 and 1970, the movie Ryan's Daughter came to the same part of Ireland. It was the closest thing to a um, volcan volcanic eruption, okay? Uh, Taoiseach Jack Lynch met uh, Charles de Gaulle off the plane and uh, he also visited the set of um, of uh, Ryan's daughter, not on the same day, okay? Uh, Charles de Gaulle was looking for a quiet place. He had no idea that in uh, Kerry, everybody knows everybody's business. Um, the story in Ryan's daughter is about an affair, an adulterous affair, which one would like to keep as private as possible. But again, it's impossible because the village idiot managed to be, manages to be witness to everything that's happening in uh, the town, even in private places. The press and paparazzi flocked to Sneem, where Charles de Gaulle there was, was hoping to get an interview or a sighting, but there was no sighting, no sign of him. He stuck to his hotel. It was like waiting for Godot French Irish connection. Let me roll the drums. Waiting for Godot. Samuel Beckett. Here we go. One of the things that Charles de Gaulle did in Ireland was visit the ancestral place of Daniel O'Connell. For those of you who don't live in Ireland, a O'Connell Bridge and O'Connell Street are central in Dublin. And there's a wonderful statue of Daniel O'Connell, 
where he is surrounded by four uh, virtues, uh, which are courage, fidelity, patriotism, and eloquence. He is known as the liberator, okay? And so was Charles de Gaulle, the liberator of France. Uh, Daniel O'Connell uh, was uh, wanted to, to promote the repeal of the Act of Union of 1800, which united uh, Great Britain and Ireland under the United Kingdom. He wanted Ireland to rule itself under Queen Victoria, and he led a number of rallies across the country. And the story of the Rose of Tralee in Kerry uh, crosses paths uh, with Daniel O'Connell. But back to uh, Charles de Gaulle, if you're still following, and I hope I'm not um, wi winding you down a, a dark stair, but um, with the help of the drums and little connections, I hope you're following me and that I haven't lost you. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Uh, Charles de Gaulle's granny wrote a book about Daniel O'Connell. So he was brought up and uh, knowing, apparently Daniel O'Connell had an international reputation. He said uh, two lovely things, which I will attempt to say in French, if you just bear with me. En ce moment grave de ma longue vie, je trouvais ici ce que je cherchais, être en face de moi-même. Irlande me l'a offerte de, fa de façon très délicate, la plus amicale. Je le rends merci. At this solemn moment of my long life, here I have found what I was looking for, to be face to face with myself. Ireland has extended it to me in the most delicate way, the most friendly manner. I thank her. Funny things happened, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, hotels had to make a long bed for a man who was six foot five inches by putting a single bed at the foot of a double bed and making sheets that would fit without letting anybody know that a bed couldn't be ordered because they would have known that Charles de Gaulle was going to stay there. Um, um, so ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to kind of mark the beginning of the cabaret <laughs> by saying something that somebody put on Facebook, which is lovely. Liberté, égalité et cabaret. Okay, and I'm going to introduce a scene from Madame Bovary, um, which is uh, by Gustave Flaubert, and the theme, like which inspired the, the David Lean movie Ryan's Daughter, is adultery, an everyday subject. We all know what the Saint Asset is in Paris where traffic is very heavy, it is understood that under the excuse of traffic, one might have, you know, a, a secondary person that one meets outside of their marital bliss. Um, so Madame Bovary uh, goes to, through amorous and financial attempts to escape in vain the tedium of her life. What? It is you. Yes, it is me, Rodolphe. I should like to ask for your advice. You have not changed. You're charming. As ever. Oh, they are poor charms since you disdain them. No matter. I have suffered much. Such is life. Has life been good to you, at least, since our separation? Neither good nor bad. Perhaps it would have been better never to have parted. Yes, perhaps. You think so? Oh, Rodolphe. Why? You've been crying. What for? Oh, forgive me. You're, you're the only one who pleases me. I was imbecile and cruel. I love you. I will always love you. Now tell me, what is it? 
12. I am ruined, Rodolphe. You must lend me 3,000 francs. What? You know that my husband had placed his whole fortune at the notaries. He ran away. So we borrowed. The patients don't pay us. Moreover, the settling of the estate is not yet done. We shall have the money later on. But today, for want of 3,000 francs, we are to be sold up. It is to be at once, this very moment. And counting upon your friendship, I have come to you. Oh, dear madame, I haven't got them. You have not got them. You have not got them. I ought to have spared myself this last shame. You never loved me. You are no better than the others. You know, I quite, I'm quite out of myself. Oh, I pity you, yes, very much. You have a chateau, farms, woods, you go hunting, you travel to Paris. Why, if it were but that, but the least of these trifles, one can get money for them. No, oh, I do not want them, keep them. But I, I would have given you everything. I would have sold all, worked for you with my hands. I would have begged on the high roads for a smile, for a look to hear you say thank you. And you sit there quietly in your armchair as if you had not made me suffer enough already. But for you, and you know it, I might have lived happily. What made you do it? Was it a bet? Yet you loved me, you, you said so. And but a moment since, oh, it would have been better to have driven me away. My hands are hot with your kisses. And there is the spot on the carpet where on my knees you swore an eternity of love. You made me believe. For two years you helped me the most magnificent, the sweetest dream. Hey, our plans for the journey, do you remember? Oh, your letter, your letter. Told my heart. And then, when I come back to him, to him rich, happy, free, to implore the help, the first stranger would give a suppliant and bringing back to him all my tenderness, he repulses me because it would cost him 3,000 francs. Tiens, c'est vous. Oui, c'est moi. Je voudrais, Rodolphe, vous demander un conseil. Vous n'avez pas changé. Vous êtes toujours aussi charmante. Oh, ce sont de tristes charmes, mon ami, puisque vous les avez dédaignés. N'importe, j'ai bien souffert. L'existence est ainsi. A-t-elle été du moins bonne pour vous depuis notre séparation Oh, ni bonne ni mauvaise. Il aurait peut-être mieux fallu ne pas nous quitter. <rire> oui, peut-être. Tu crois Oh, Rodolphe, si tu savais, je t'ai bien aimé. Comment voulais-tu que je vécusse sans toi On ne peut pas se déshabituer du bonheur. J'étais désespérée. J'ai cru mourir. 
Oh, je te conterai tout cela, tu verras. Et toi, tu m'as fui. Tu en aimes d'autres, avoue-le. Oh, je les comprends, va. Tu as tout ce qu'il faut pour te faire chérir. Mais nous recommencerons, n'est-ce pas Oh, nous nous aimerons. Tiens, je ris, je suis heureuse. Mais parle donc. Mais tu as pleuré. Pourquoi Oh, pardonne-moi, tu, tu es la seule qui, qui me plaise. Tu étais imbécile et cruel. Je t'aime. <rire> je t'aime et je t'aimerai toujours. Et puis quand je reviens vers lui, vers lui qui est riche, heureux, libre, pour implorer un secours que le premier venu rendrait, suppliante, et lui rapportant toute ma tendresse, il me repousse. Parce que ça lui coûterait 3000 francs. Je ne les ai pas. Shakuti. Well, this is nice, Rose. While well, you're back then. Yes, I'm back and I am. Um, I, I, uh, I came to meet you. Well, that was kind. A party of us went to a couple of concerts while we were there. I saved you the programs. The Royal Philharmonic. Bear Loves and Tchaikovsky. It's no Beethoven? <laughs> no, Beethoven. Do you know that the British government has banned the playing of German music? No. Can you imagine such foolishness? It's British. <laughs> well, all governments are foolish, more or less. An Irish government would do the same. You enjoyed yourself in Dublin then? Well, I didn't, I didn't. Uh, a conference of school teachers, you know, it's not exactly a, um, how can I put it? A, a bacchanalia. A bacchanalia, <laughs> precisely. We did have some interesting discussions though. There was a lady among us from Belfast, a, a very stimulating woman. Oh. Did she come to the concert? She had the score. And in what way precisely was she stimulating? She had a fine and a fresh mind, Rose. Very modern in her thoughts. She's been at the teaching for over 50 years. Old folks with fresh minds are very stimulating. Then there was a ministry inspector. He gave us a dress. The best we had was... A Professor from the Sorbonne. Now there was a man with a mind, if you like. Why? What did he say? I couldn't tell you, Rosie. Whatever it was, it was wasted on us. Teachers are a poor lot, surely. If teachers were the poor lot, like you're always talking, <laughs> how would pupils be learning such riches? What? Some young fella's going to be a lucky man, Rosie. Oh, I've got something in my eye. <laughs> Rose. It's a nuisance. Will I get it out then? Oh, no, it's nothing. I've come to say something. I feel like a child in this place, and I'm not a child. <laughs> Do you know that? I know that, Rosie. I've... Maybe I have an idea of what you come to say. You've no idea at all. <laughs> Well, I'm just saying, in case it helps a bit, I maybe have. I love you. Rosie, this sort of thing can come about, you know. A girl taking a fancy to a teacher. 
Fancy all it is, Rose. You've mistaken a penny mirror for the sun. Do you not see that? I see you always digging a low pit for yourself when you should be standing on a heap of pride. Well, Rose, you're coming here today and saying what you've said is the only cause I've ever had for pride. Don't you see, Rosie? I only taught you about Byron, Beethoven, and Captain Blood. I'm not one of them fellas. I'm not daft, you know. But you're terribly young. <laughs> and that's a hanging matter, isn't it? No, it, it's not. Well then? It's not a hanging matter to be young, but it maybe should be a hanging matter for a man of middle years to try and steal the youth from a young girl. Especially a man like me and a girl like you. You were meant for the wide world, not this. Me, I was born for it. It wouldn't do, Rosie. I just know it wouldn't. So you don't want me then? Don't want you. and hold me fast this magic spell you've cast it is lovey on rosa and when you kiss me heaven sighs and though i close my eyes i see lovey on rosa me to your heart I'm in a world apart a world where roses bloom and when you speak angels seem to sing from above everyday words seem to turn into love songs heart and soul to me and life will always be Give your heart and 
soul to me And life would surely be Merci bien. This is a kind of a, it's um this came to me uh, this theme came to me the last uh, week and a half to write about um my experience of France and it begins with that the eternal mind of mankind may rest in silence. When I was in France five years ago, the distance from our country gave me a sense that maybe if I went there to live, I could write our story from a place of peace. That was the time I visited the Matisse Chapel. I only got 10 minutes there, but here I am now from the evolving years, writing from my own Matisse Chapel, growing in my home over the pandemic. <laughs> It's a connection to that childlike spiritual love I saw in Matisse's final life's work. And here I have found my own cross and my own tabernacle, my own ascension and my own revelations, my own loss, my own redemption. I have even painted here my own depiction of a prodigal return. I have painted the grace of my own homecoming, my yearning to return after all the storms and the dark places of life. But this work that I'm painting, that I'm engaged in, it is also born of my Irish heritage, of a new great journey I have been on across the terrain of the last five years. It is painted with the mystery of a thousand spirals, Celtic symbols and ancient prayers. My home has its own altars of equinox and solstice, of sleeping winter and blossoming spring. The goddess Primavera is here, the giving sun, the poetic moon. It is a temple of birth and death, of seasons waiting for blessings when the light box unifies with the cosmos to reveal our glory to ourselves. The human spirit's longing for meaning. Um, the childlike, it is the childlike French love, Amour of Matisse, and the deep ancient yearning for light of our ancestors. And here I am now, have I painted myself into a place where I have the power to face both the darkness and the light of our journey. I will begin far away across the, across the sea in the distance and beauty of France and translate our story into a holy temple where we can find solace and refuge and a pathway home for our hearts. Lesson one. My truth is not always beautiful, but I am beautiful in my truth. It was in the city of Nice that I had the dream about the bluebird. I went there for a few days at age 32 to find solace for an aching attachment to another sad clan. Cause I gave this dance to a man before, but what I had was never enough. And then things got rough and I couldn't couple. So he roared from the sores of his mother love stuff. Un clown triste, a sad clan. Un clown fâché, an angry clan. Un clown tormenté, a tormented clan. I journaled from my three star hotel, affordable for a few days in off season. And I found that as I wrote my chaotic turmoil into the French language, I began to translate myself, my suffering, my whole being into the French terrain. Mon cœur brisé, my broken heart. Mon désir, my ache. Mon, mon amant cruel, my cruel lover. I felt the kind sun on my face as I walked the elegant streets and my feelings of being a downtrodden and worthless, worthless Irish girl 
were getting touched and transformed. I was une femme triste here, a sad woman, but also to the men who gallantly opened doors for me and did not suppress their delight in my feminine presence, I was une femme, but I was une belle femme triste, a woman of sad beauty. I took refuge in the churches from the unaccustomed attention and there from the sordid guilt and damp misery of my childhood religion, I found myself re-enchanted with Les Églises Catholiques de la France. I prayed to the beautifully wrought crucifix crucifixions and pietas. I took comfort from how Jesus, Jésus, here too, had translated his torment into French beauty. The Lamb of God, l'agneau de Dieu, qui enlève les péchés du monde, prend pitié de nous. I knelt with the elegant French widows who were perfectly coiffed in their black lace dresses and exquisite nylons and footwear. I lit my candles and asked for compassion from Jesus Christ, whose message was to transform suffering into this love, this beauty, beauté, this poetry, poesy, this grace, grass. Here Jesus was a poet and poet and artist, and so were all his saints, two artists, and their trade and tools were love, l'amour, la compassion, la pitié. Outside the glare of the tourist town roared on. In here, in the quiet du tabernacle, du, du tabernacle sacré, I prayed for all the players in my Irish life. I saw them all renewed in the language of French sainthood. My friends, my best friends, I beatified. Declan the anarchist who poured his idealistic quest for justice into playwriting. I saw him as a saint of theatre, un saint de théâtre. His girlfriend, his lover, his amant, the environmentalist Sarah Moon, who bled for the sorrow of our earth. I saw her as a saint of nature, la terre sacrée. My best friend Kate, who turned all her turmoil and trouble into glorious humor, she became une sacrée comédienne, a saint of divine comedy. And the sad tormentor, tormented clown who I loved, he became a saint du cirque, a circus angel, seeking solace for his self-hatred in the genius of his gifts. Was all this not similar to the work of Jesus Christ, his love translating everything on the cross into a gift for all humanity? Um, un trésor for the monde entier. And I, I too sought redemption in my work, my craft, a circus girl, a cabaret sinner, a fallen angel, an ange déchu maudit. Cause I'm not made to try to squeeze into clothes too small just to people please. And I'm not made to strain to fit on truth in the place where my conscience sits. But the artist in me has a rogue honesty that lives for gratuitous giving. I sit by the sea and my net fills with dreams. With a girl's intuition, I bring home visions. I sat by the sun-drenched stones of Nice, the turquoise waters, and made ready to return to Dublin after five days. And that was the night I had the dream. The blue bird of beauty returning to heaven from whence she came on turquoise wings of art. L'oiseau bleu qui retourne au ciel, ciel sky, ciel also heaven. Al, the El Turquoise, art, l'art, and our journey is one from suffering, la souffrance. And that bird became the symbol for my life's journey ever since. But first I had to return to Dublin. And I brought them all, my friends, all individual postcards, telling them they were all saints. And it landed heavily and awkwardly back in the return translation to toxic Irish Catholicism. The atheist anarchist was not pleased at all to be beatified. 
But I think that I have found a way to tell our story here from my Matisse Chapel in my own home. This French inspiration coupling with my ancient Irish soul. Our story is not beautiful, but we can become beautiful here if we tell it on turquoise wings soaring home to art and meaning. And the delicate scent of bruised roses, whose petals were crushed underfoot, and have suffered the sentence I know is the road to transcend to the lush living world. Thank you. Um, a good few years ago, uh, I lived in Nice in the south of France and um, had a, I lived there for a year and have a good memory of um, being on the promenade des Anglais, which is on the, the Bay des Anges, which is uh, the Mediterranean, I suppose. And uh, there's a lovely beach there. And I remember spending time with my friends there after long nights out, um, you know, <laughs> where the sea is there and just kind of shouting out literary terms and phrases into into the night like uh, cry havoc and release the hands of war and that kind of stuff so this song kind of uh, it's called uh, Morning Mist Tone 
has grown so wistful Remember back when in the morning mist we'd stumble in the dawn With our heads full of words, screaming out the songs yeah, Screaming at the birds, all the birds, the birds, the birds All the birds, the birds, the birds All the birds, the birds, the birds The movie uh, in Bruges, okay, and I have to give you a warning uh, that the 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 topics are dark, funny, savage, and deeply compassionate. So only half of those were warnings. Uh, the language is pretty bad, and the themes are heavy. Okay, so if anybody wants to turn their volume down or leave the meeting and come back in, I'll see you in the waiting room and I'll let you in. It's n I just need to to warn you because in the midst of beauty, it might take you aback, even though it's a very highly accomplished uh, script by Martin McDonough. And I just want to explain why it's in this show, okay? Uh, Martin McDonough is a son of Irish parents. In uh, Flaubert, in Madame Bovary, presents the setting through the characters. Um, David Lean in Ryan's Daughter presents the setting through the characters. Martin McDonough in In Bruges presents the setting through the characters. In all three works of art, they use panoramic landscape. In the film In Bruges, two Irish hitmen are waiting for instructions from Harry, their boss, because a, one of the, the youngest of the two in his first job committed a big error. He was supposed to kill one adult person who happened to be a priest. And in, a, in killing him, one of the bullets goes through him and kills a child who was waiting to go for confession. These two Irish hitmen are waiting in Bruges for Harry with connotations and suggestions of waiting for Godot. Um, Charles de Gaulle came to Ireland as a wounded hero, a sore soldier. He was hurting, he was broken. In Ryan's Daughter, the soldier who comes to carry and who ends up having the affair with, with Rose is a, on a re retreat. He's injured and they're bringing him to a place where the job is, is easy and where he can rest uh, from the shell shock of war. And in Bruges, uh, Ken and Ray are on a, on a retreat. They're on time out. They don't know what's going to happen next, but they definitely need time out. And finally, the entertainment value is so good. I just wanted to enjoy this scene. Well, the boy is suicidal, Harry. He's a, a, a walking dead man. He keeps on going on about hell and purgatory. When I found you yesterday, did I ask you, Ken, will you do me a favour and become Ray's psychiatrist, please? No. What I think I asked you was, could you go blow his fucking head off for me? He's suicidal. I'm suicidal. You're suicidal. Everybody's fucking suicidal. We don't all keep going on about it. Has he killed himself yet? No. So he's not fucking suicidal, is he? He put a loaded gun to his head this morning. I stopped him. He... What? Oh, this gets fucking worse. We were down in the park. No, 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 no. Let me get this right. You were down in the park? What's that got to do with fucking anything? No, 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 no. Let me get this right. Not only... 
have you refused to kill the boy, you've even stopped the boy from killing himself, which would have solved my problem, which would have solved your problem, which sounds like it would have solved the boy's problem. It wouldn't have solved his problem. Ken. Kenny, Kenny, Kenny. If I killed a little kid, accidentally or otherwise, I wouldn't have thought twice. I'd have killed myself on the fucking spot. On the fucking spot. I'd have That's... stuck my gun in my mouth in the fucking spot. That's you, Harry. This boy has the capacity to change. This boy has the capacity to, to make a decent life for himself. Excuse me, Ken. I have the capacity to change. Yeah, you do. You have the capacity to get fucking worse. Oh, OK, now, now, now we're getting down to it. Harry, Harry, let's face it, and I'm not being funny, I mean no disrespect, but you're a cunt. You're a cunt now, you've always been a cunt, and the only thing that's going to change for you is that you're going to become an even bigger cunt. Maybe have some more cunt kids. Leave more kids fucking out of it. What have they done? You fucking retract that bit about my cunt fucking kids. I retract that bit about your cunt fucking kids. Insulting my fucking kids. That's going overboard, mate. I retracted it, didn't I? Still leaves you being a fucking cunt. Yeah. I fucking got that. Hello. Bonjour. Vive le cabaret. <laughs> That's kind of the extent of my French, so that's it really. Uh, we're going to be looking at some of the Franco-Irish connections in the works of James Joyce. Um, there's lots. Yeah, we need far too many <laughs> drum rolls because there's far too many Franco-Irish connections. We're just going to look at two, so we won't keep it that long. So the first one we're going to look, like, look at is kind of from Dubliners, uh, from After the Races, uh, which might have been influenced by an early trip to Paris where uh, James actually thought he was going to study medicine and um, didn't in the end. It wasn't his thing. He did end up living in Paris for like the last 20 years of his life and wrote Ulysses there and well, finished Ulysses there and wrote Finnegan's Wake. But we're going back to Dubliners after the races. So gang of lads, different nationalities. There's one French, one Irish, one Canadian, one hung Hungarian. I think they meet an American and an Englishman along the way. Anyway, they're hammered because they, they actually didn't win the race. They came second or third, but it was the French car and they were the favourite and they're all thrilled. So they're all completely drunk and they sing this childhood nursery rhyme from France. There's a, a definite childhood theme going on in everything we're doing for some reason, Doreen, I'm not really sure why. Um, this is a car horn, in case you're wondering. and. Uh, I just want to see if it breaks the internet. Okay, <laughs> so let's just check. <laughs> oh, are you still with us? I think so. I think they're there. <laughs> I really hope so. <laughs> this is called Cadet Roussel. It's a French nursery rhyme and um, it's about money and status, which of course all kids are totally into. <laughs> Cadet-Roussel à toi maison, Cadet-Roussel à toi maison, qui n'en est poutre ni chevron, qui n'en est poutre ni chevron. C'est pour la gelasie rondelle, qui direz-vous de Cadet-Roussel? Ah, ah, ah oui vraiment, Cadet-Roussel est bon enfant. Cadet-Roussel has got three eyes, Cadet-Roussel has got three eyes. One looks to Ken, the other my side, one looks to Ken, the other my side. Because his vision is not clear, the third eye is his monocle. Ah, 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 oui, Raymond. Cadre Roussel est bon enfant. Cadre Roussel has got three shoes. Cadre Roussel has got three shoes. On his feet he places two. On his feet he places two. 
The third he knows not where to stick, he uses it to fit his beautiful ha 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 we remont, cadre roussel et mon enfant. Cadarousel has got three cents, Cadarousel has got three cents, but Cadarousel must pay his debts, Cadarousel must pay his debts. To creditors he shows his cash, then snaps his purse and off he'll dash up. Ah, 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 we Raymond, Cadarousel est bon enfant. Cadarousel has got three banks, Cadarousel has got three banks. Into which the country sank, into which the country sank. Two he sold to Germany, and now the country's on its knees. Ah, 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 ah oui, Raymond, car de Bruxelles est bon enfant. Ah, 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 ah oui, Raymond, car de Bruxelles est bon enfant. Dear Stevie, I sent you a little cat filled with sweets a few days ago, but perhaps you do not know the story about the cat of Beaugency. Beaugency is a tiny old town on a bank of the Loire, France's longest river. It is also a very wide river, for France at least. At Beaugency, it is so wide that if you wanted to cross it from one bank to the other, you would have to take at least 1,000 steps. Long ago, the people of Beaugency, when they wanted to cross it, they had to go in a boat for there was no bridge and they could not make one for themselves or pay anyone else to make one. So what were they to do? The devil, who was always reading the newspapers, heard about this sad state of theirs so he dressed himself and came to call on the Lord Mayor of Beaugency, who was a name, who was named Monsieur Alfred Byrne. This Lord Mayor was very fond of dressing himself also. He wore a scarlet robe and always had a great golden chain around his neck, even when he was fast asleep in bed, with his knees up to his mouth. The devil told the Lord Mayor what he had read in the newspaper and said he could make a bridge for the people of Beaugency so that they could cross the river as often as they wished. He said he could make as good a bridge as was ever made and make it in one single night. The Lord Mayor asked him how much money he wanted for making such a bridge. No money at all, said the devil. All I ask is the first person who crosses the bridge shall belong to me. Good, said the Lord Mayor. The night came down. All the people in Beaugency went to bed and slept. The morning came, and when they put their heads out of the windows, they cried, Oh, Loire, what a fine bridge! for they saw a fine, strong stone bridge thrown across the wide river. All the people ran down to the head of the bridge and looked across it. There was the devil, standing at the other side of the bridge, waiting for the first person who should cross it. But nobody dared cross it for fear of the devil. Then there was a sound of bugles, was a sign for the people to be silent. And the Lord Mayor, Monsieur Alfred Byrne, appeared in his great scarlet robe and wearing his heavy golden chain round his neck. He'd a bucket of water in one hand and under his arm, the other arm, he carried a cat. The devil stopped dancing when he saw him from the other side of the bridge and put up his long spy glass. All the people whispered to one another. And the cat looked up at the Lord Mayor, because in the town of Beaugency, it was allowed that a cat should look at a Lord Mayor. When he was tired of looking at the Lord Mayor, because even a cat grows tired of looking at a Lord Mayor, 
he began to play with the Lord Mayor's golden chain. When the Lord Mayor came to the head of the bridge, every man held his breath and every woman held her tongue. The Lord Mayor put the cat down on the bridge and quick as a thought, splash, he emptied the whole bucket of water over it. The cat, who is now between the devil and the bucket of water, made up his mind quite as quickly and ran with his ears back across the bridge and into the devil's arms. The devil mostly speaks a language of his own called Belzebubble, which he makes up himself as he goes along. But when he is very angry, he can speak quite bad French very well. Though some who have heard him say that he has quite a strong Dublin accent. The devil was as angry as the devil himself. Monsieur le Bergentien, vous n'êtes pas de Bergendre too. Vous n'êtes que des chats. Viens ici, mon petit chat. Tu es pour mon beau petit chou chat. Viens ici, le diable t'emporte. On va se show for to lay do. And off he went with the cat. And since that time, the people of that town are called Les Chattes de Beaugency. But the bridge is still there, and there are boys and girls walking and riding and playing upon it. I hope you will like this story. Nono.